I'm Shiva Rodriguez, director and co-writer of Father of Lies. Today I'll be talking about the characters of this short story, which was actually drawn from a much larger story. In many stories told today, he's cast as a villain, but Loki is actually a very complicated character. For this film, I wanted to get closer to the mythology and show how he came from being a helpful trickster to a treacherous villain. I really thought that the racism played a large part in Loki's story. He's a powerful Jotun living among the Azir, who consider themselves superior and never fail to remind him of that. The cruelty that Loki endures when he loses his family is the turning point for him. He becomes withdrawn, and then finally snaps when the gods come to taunt him. He knows he can inflict the most painful wound by striking down Baldur. His punishment for that is agonizing. So once freed on Earth, Loki's only interest is liberating his children to destroy the gods once and for all. I got this one from the boy, but I have three children. Odin is the king of the gods, and he's not the nice old man that some stories would have you believe. For this tale, I wanted Odin to appear much more ancient than the others, and be very aware of the end of the world drawing nigh. Odin's mistake is to try to prevent fate by ordering Loki's children to be taken without telling anybody the reason why. While Loki's wife is killed, he knows the only way he'll be able to control the Odin is to give him some hope of reuniting him with his children once an unobtainable goal is met. The children are fine where they are, and you will be reunited with them, Loki, as soon as all of Asgard is convinced that you are worthy. A curious note about the story is that while Loki is known as the father of lies, he never once tells a falsehood. Meanwhile, Odin is both deceitful and callous, making us ponder who the real father of lies is. Thor is usually viewed as being a hero to the humans, but in this story I wanted to show his mean-spirited side as well. Traditionally, his favorite pastime is killing Jotuns, which would make sense for him to have a special disliking for Loki and his kin. Thor is portrayed here as being proud and stubborn, and he doesn't always think things through. When Loki kills his younger brother, Thor seeks to punish him in the worst possible way imaginable by tying him to a tree that would keep him hidden from the sight for all eternity. He didn't count on the magic diminishing when the enchanted tree finally died. During filming, the original actor who was cast as Thor was a no-show. Fortunately, our assistant director had the skills to jump into the part literally a few hours before the scenes were shot. A foolish desire for everyone succumbs to my stories, including the Allfather. <coughs> you think the Allfather will return your children to you? Tyr is another complicated character that I wish we had more time to show in this short film. He's a god of both war and justice, and is often conflicted with Odin's orders. In the feature-length screenplay, he's also Sigyn's brother. Tyr famously lost his hand while binding Loki's wolf son Fenrir, which makes him very identifiable to the fans of North mythology. The missing hand was actually quite a challenge for the actor, who had to learn how to handle a sword left-handed. It also made things interesting for him on set, especially during breaks and meals while he was unable to remove the prosthetic stump. I wonder how that hand tasted. Why don't you try some yourself? In the mythology, Baldur is described as being the most beautiful god that everybody but Loki wants to protect. I wanted to play around with the concept of what would make him stand out as being a popular guy amongst a group of men far more skilled in battle. So Baldur became a jovial drinking buddy type who wears a mead horn on his belt instead of a sword. I knew we weren't going to have time to explain how his mother extracted promises from almost everything in the world not to harm him, so instead the task fell to Thor and Tyr to constantly protect him. This also made him very smug, so much to the point that he felt safe antagonizing a Jotun. She was a stupid woman. I wouldn't have thought she had a brain until I saw it bashed out of her skull with mine own eyes. Hell is one of the trickier characters to portray, and outside of artwork I've never seen her played by a small child. Since Hell is an infant at the beginning of the story, 
I decided to make her appear as a young girl a thousand years later to illustrate how slowly the gods age. I thought she would have a sweet disposition, even though she is the harbinger of Ragnarok. Although dead and horribly disfigured, she spent all her time ruling the underworld surrounded by the souls of people who died outside of battle. I imagine that would be mostly women, children, and infirm men. That sort of company would be fond of their young mistress and not give her cause to grow to be cruel. Ella! Ella! <laughs> Not much is really known about Zygain in mythology other than she was a very devoted wife to Loki and went to great lengths to prevent his suffering. I saw Zygain in a way to illustrate what was taken from Loki. She is the only Azir who truly loved and accepted him, which made her priceless to him. While traditionally in the mythology Zygain lives, I felt it would be far more dramatic to open the story with her trying to defend against the abduction of Loki's children and losing that battle. While I don't consider myself to be an actress, I did take the role of Siggy for safety's sake. I'd rather take the bruises being thrown around on a concrete floor than try to teach an actress how to handle the sword badly and all the stunts in a short period of time. As it turns out, I did have my arm in a sling for about a week after shooting that opening scene. 